Hi, welcome to Boom It's on the Blockchain. My name is uh, Alistair Caithness and today we've got a special guest. His name is Adam Bloomberg. He's a friend of mine. I've known him a number of years. He's been in the cryptocurrency space. He is a financial advisor and he has a fantastic perspective in providing a way to understand the industry that I think all our viewers are going to love. Hey, so, Alistair, yeah. how are you? Yeah, good, Adam. How are things with you? Uh, things are great, man. It's... Uh... It's great to see what's happening in the in the cryptocurrency world. Blockchain decentralized finance is getting really popular, and here we are to to you know help people understand it. That's our role. Perfect. So yeah, so just introduce yourself, Adam, and let the viewers know a little bit about yourself and sure. just about background. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much, Alistair, for having me on. Uh, I, I think I've been on this podcast uh, early early on in the in the early days of it, so it's great to be back and see what you've been doing. But we, uh, you know, I started as a, as a financial advisor, started in this realm as a financial advisor, traditional finance, um, have a partner named Ron, and we have a, an RIA, a registered investment advisor in Texas, and been in, the, in traditional finance as a financial advisor since 2000, early 2009, uh, found cryptocurrency in 2017, started going down the, the proverbial rabbit hole, uh, learning all about blockchain, um, digital assets, eventually decentralized finance to the point that I just knew it was going to be something really, really big, um, kind of a, akin to how I felt about the Internet back in, uh, you know, maybe 1995 or so. That's kind of what I thought of it as the Internet of, of finance, of course. And so now uh, we decided to kind of get rid of our traditional financial advisory firm because what we want to do is really educate people about crypto, about blockchain, about Bitcoin, uh, digital assets, decentralized finance. We started a YouTube channel a few years ago, and here we are now with uh, courses. We have a course where we teach financial advisors about this, and we teach it in a way where they can help their clients and so they can build a practice around it. And then we also have a, uh, an academy that we just launched because we want to teach any investor, anyone who wants to learn about crypto, learn about Bitcoin and blockchain, how to how to uh, understand it first and foremost, how to be safe with it, how to potentially invest, and, and even just how to, we want to teach them how the technology works because it might be, have implications for their business. It might have implications for their life above and beyond just being able to put money into it. It might implicate, or, or might have implications on my life, on my career, if I'm in banking or oil and gas or something else. And I might just want to know about the technology and what's coming. And that's what we want to have it as our academy. So we come at it from a different angle because of our career and our lives as financial advisors that we're not, we're, we're not trying to get you to buy. We're not trying to, to get you to trade. We're not trying to tell you what tokens are going to go up. We have no idea. We just want you to understand it. See, obviously the first thing that's come along is Bitcoin. So for our viewers as a starting point, can you give a bit of a timeline, sort of a, a quick overview of how the Bitcoin changed everything? You're right. The first thing we try to teach people is about Bitcoin because it, once you get Bitcoin, then everything else seem, seems to fall in place. Because if you understand how Bitcoin works, you understand how blockchains work, wallets, custody, and then we can go into different types of blockchains. So um, for, for the viewers where Bitcoin started, of course, 2008 with a, a white paper on October 31st, 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, first block was mined in 2009. But the idea was simply, how can we interact financially? How can you and I interact without having to go through a bank, without having to go through all the, the pipes and plumbing that banks had built, because by virtue of the fact that they're the ones who built all that plumbing, they get to be the gatekeepers and they get to cause all sorts of friction. And because of that friction, they have power and they get to charge fees. And, and these people who got together, the, the cypherpunks, uh, probably numerous of them got together and they are collectively Satoshi Nakamoto. There's probably not one person, it's probably multiple people, but they basically said, Let, let's take some principles of programming, of, crypt, of cryptography, and can we create a way where you and I, Alistair, can exchange money that doesn't go through the banking rails? 
And then can we do so with some sort of money that is not denoted and not valued and not created by a government, which can determine the value, but we can determine the value of that money. And that's where Bitcoin came from. It's the idea that we can use cryptography and those principles to not only create the system that allows us to exchange something, but also create the something that we're going to exchange. And that is Bitcoin. So. Um, not a whole lot of financial advisors that have been in, in this for 30 years are going to really trust this this system. So it starts with, uh, again, the education. Here's what Bitcoin is. Here's how blockchains work. Here's how custody is going to work. Because, of course, as you know, custody and wallets work differently with digital assets than they do with traditional assets. So the, that that trust of, of some sort of code and all these computers that are interconnected is a really hard thing to, to get over. The fact that we now trust, we've outsourced trust to banks and to financial institutions for so long that that's just what we're used to. It's spoon fed to us. It, it's really easy. So trying to get financial advisors to understand is not very, is not very easy. Now, when they have clients coming to them saying, I really want to get into Bitcoin, I want to invest in Bitcoin, I want to invest in cryptocurrency, that has been the impetus for a lot of financial advisors to say, I need to figure this out. So it starts with understanding how can my clients invest in or participate in Bitcoin? And that's what's going to start to get us down that road of, of they, ha they have to learn Bitcoin, then they're going to have to learn blockchains, then they're going to have to learn decentralized finance because it all you know, eventually flows in that direction. Um, you know, I first met Adam at uh, uh, Oil Blockchain um, <laughs> Conference in Houston. And, you know, it, the blockchain industry in Houston is obviously kicking off. But when you were presenting at that event, what you were, how were you explaining what you were doing that's relevant to the oil and energy industry? Um, so at that event, which I remember was in, I, I believe, April of 2019, so way, way back in the early days of crypto, right? Um, we, we were talking about smart contracts and, and, you know, in your case and in the oil and gas industry, of course, uh, in, in any industry, a smart contract is, is literally just a piece of code that runs on a, a blockchain. And it is it, the easiest way to think that I think of it as, is like a, if then statement, right? If a certain event happens, then something else happens. If, uh, I pull a barrel of oil out of the ground, um, and it gets to a certain point based on GPS locators, then you will take ownership of that barrel of oil and you will pay me a certain amount of cryptocurrency. And that can happen automatically without either of us having to press a button or anything. That, that is kind of the gist of a uh, smart contract. And, we, and from there, you can take smart contracts in, in all sorts of different levels. They can help you uh, denote and track ownership. They can help move money back and forth. They can help with all sorts of financial instruments, uh, financial investments, lending, uh, investment, um, all sorts of other investment opportunities that we see by virtue of the fact that we're using these smart contracts. Now, what, what we explain, what, what people do at the time where we met Alistair at that conference, uh, my partner Ron and I were really just trying to educate people about blockchain in general, anything we could do, whether it was in finance, uh, oil and gas, construction, um, anything like that. We were just talking about how great it could be to automate more of the process. And most importantly, really, to have this um, to have this public database, this transparent database, this immutable database where we could all look at the data and know that it was valid and know who owns something at any one point and how that transfer is going. And, and we could, I could know that um, you were going to pay me a certain amount of money and I wouldn't have to worry about whether or not you had it. I could see in your wallet that you have that amount of money that you owe me. And we can make sure there's some auto pay feature set up that, that goes above and beyond what can be done with banks currently. So that's what we were talking about at that conference. And when we met, um, when you were looking at your uh, tokenization project. So, you know, what we were doing when we originally spoke at the, the conference there, and I, I spoke about Zincoin, we created a security token mm -hmm. that was going to be an underlying token for the oil and energy industry. You know, as we've developed the project, you know, trying to get the sort of super majors to buy into one underlying token for the energy industry is going to be a difficult thing, especially if it's not branded in uh, their name. You know, so why would they want to use something like Zincoin? So as we've developed our platform and energy tokens, um, 
what we are now able to do is to create tokens on behalf of other energy operators. Well, what it, it really means is you can you can really open up the investment opportunities. So whereas now most investors don't have access to invest in something like oil, uh, you know, oil rigs or, or or drilling or barrels of oil or gas or what have you, they just don't have that level of access. And part of it is because there are so there's so much regulation, there's so much legality, and it's so hard to actually transfer ownership of something like that, that it all has to be wrapped in a bunch of LLC paperwork. And it's something that that is just not very easy and cost effective to transfer quickly. Therefore, most people don't get invested. It's not a liquid market. It's not transparent. It's not easy to see what I'm earning. Um, so you, you have to have big companies and big infrastructure around it. When you can tokenize it, you can take out a lot of those middlemen. You can take out a lot of those inefficiencies. And now what you've done is you've opened up that investment opportunity. Now I, as an investor, can potentially invest, take some of my money and invest it in some sort of energy producing asset or oil and, or oil producing asset or something along the way. And I now have the ability to participate in that. Uh, in a way that I didn't before, because right now all I can do is I can buy, you know, energy related stocks. I can buy energy related ETFs. If I'm an accredited investor, maybe I can get into some sort of oil and gas LL, uh, LLC, MLP, something like that, which is highly illiquid. And so I have to I have to weigh those two things in the future. I won't have to. I will have liquid. Uh, I will have the ability to participate in something that is liquid, that is in the oil and gas realm, that is you know, directly related to the price of oil at that particular time, that is not a publicly traded stock. It's a token that can be represented. What I mean for the producers is they potentially have more ability to raise funds earlier on and to raise funds in smaller amounts. And you, can, and you don't have to go with bil multi-billion dollar raises. You can have much smaller raises to be able to go drill a little bit or, or open up a little bit. You can speculate a little bit more because you don't have to get such a large investment. What it means for advisors and what it means for those investing is you better understand not only how Bitcoin works and how investing in Bitcoin works, but how the underlying kind of blockchain technology works so that you can figure out how you or your clients can invest in 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 opportunities like this, have have yield generation like this with the potential growth in the the asset and how to trade it and where where the liquidity is and the idea that if i'm an advisor my clients might have assets that are custodied in eight different places and some of which is on their personal wallet their personal hard wallet their personal soft wallet or something and i better figure out how estate planning works in that respect and that's where we're trying to uh, trying to help financial advisors not saying we're totally at that point yet however starting with this this push that clients have to say, how can you help me invest in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin for the most part? Because I see these, these billionaire hedge fund people investing in Bitcoin and doing well. I want to do it. So advisors are coming to us and saying, okay, teach me how to invest in Bitcoin. And we're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're going to teach you the technology. We're not going to make it easy for you. We're not going to just say, here's a, a ticker symbol. We're going to say, you're going to learn the technology. You're going to learn wallets and custody. You're going to learn risk and allocation. And then we're going to take you down into more blockchain stuff, into Ethereum, into smart contracts contracts in a different smart contract language in the security tokens because in just a few years that's how your clients are going to have the opportunity to invest and what it means is your clients are going to have so many more chances to participate in different different levels of, of income whereas right now that 60 40 70 30 portfolio which is you know 70 percent growth growth stocks or, or growth funds or equities which basically means i'm buying something and i hope it goes up in price i hope the next person is willing to pay more than i do versus income which is either bonds which pay virtually nothing right now or essentially real estate which has e extremely low liquidity and is not very transparent. Or if I'm a uh, you know a credit investor, maybe I can get into a private company. Maybe I can get into some sort of private investment into oil and gas, but it's highly illiquid. And now what we're going to see is on the income side, clients or, or just investors are going to have so many more options that uh, advisors haven't had to plan for in the past. We've always thought of the income side as you know, bonds or potentially real estate, if you can get it or dividend paying stocks. And it's going to be completely different. Now you're going to have all new asset classes that are going to be able to generate income for clients. They're also going to have their own liquidity. Uh, they're also going to have their own profiles that, in, that advisors and investors are going to have to understand. And that's what we're trying to teach is you don't have to know all about 
everything right now, but start down that road because it's going to be coming. You as, a, as an investor are going to have so many more investment opportunities. And this isn't speculation in, on, on Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. This is, I can invest in producing oil and gas rigs and I can participate in the oil and gas that they pull out of the ground um, based on whatever the price of oil and gas is at that particular moment. That is really, that's, that's really new and interesting and different for most investors. So that's what's so exciting about this and so exciting about what, what you're doing, Alistair, is the, the idea of, of, on one hand, the, the producers being able to find new ways to get funding, to be able to drill differently, to be able to do things differently, maybe at smaller levels so that they can prove the concept or prove the, the, the area, prove the geographic region, prove the, the distribution. And then for the investor's perspective, to be able to say, look, I want to put a little bit of money in the, into some oil and gas. I want to have some income. Um, they're going to look at income differently, and and they're now able to participate in that in a way that they know that it, that there's some liquidity there as well. They know that in a year, if oil prices run up from you know sixty dollars a barrel to eighty dollars a barrel, they can get out. They've made income along the way, plus they can get out at you know with some growth there and put that money somewhere else. This is completely new territory for us now as investors and as advisors. And that's what we're trying to teach people is you have to get the technology to understand why this, this should work and why it's different from what we have now. Yeah, that's a perfect way to actually speak about it, Adam. I also ran along the bottom there, you know, for people out there trying to, you know, because they're hearing NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and security tokens and cryptocurrency. But, you know, from an uh, investment perspective there, could you just say a little bit about the similarities between all three and the differences as well, you know, what you see as people are coming to the market space? Bet between cryptocurrency, NFTs, and security tokens? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So, so a cryptocurrency is, is uh, for the most part, something like Bitcoin, something like Ethereum, right? It, it is, uh, Bitcoin was created to be the currency of the Bitcoin network. It would be similar to if there were some internet money, you know, internet dollar or something, call it a netty or something like that, that by virtue of the fact that you were using the internet, you got more of them and then you were able to use them to, uh, transact to make purchases on the internet or to make purchases at restaurants or something. It, it, that's what it is. It is the currency of the Bitcoin network. Ethereum or ETH is the currency of the Ethereum network or the Ethereum blockchain. So that's kind of what a, a cryptocurrency is. It's we created these decentralized networks, but we had to give incentives to people to actually help process the transactions. So you hear of Bitcoin miners. A Bitcoin miner is just a computer. And in order for people to connect their computers to the Bitcoin network and process transactions so that we didn't have to use a bank, we didn't have to use a government, in order to give people the incentive to do it, we said, okay, we're going to reward you for doing that with Bitcoin. And we just have to have faith that at some point Bitcoin is going to have value because people are going to trade it and it's going to act like a currency. That's where Bitcoin came from. Ethereum ended up being the same way. It's we have to give you some sort of uh, incentive for connecting your computers and doing the work we want you to do. That's essentially a cryptocurrency. An NFT is, is basically a token, so it's a non-fungible token. A Bitcoin in, in ETH is fungible, meaning any every Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin. Just like every dollar is the same as every other dollar. My dollar is no different than your dollar. They're completely interchangeable. An NFT is non-fungible. That means my NFT is different than yours. So if I own... Uh, the the number one um, basketball card of LeBron James, the first one ever printed, and you own the second one, and there's an NFT related, my NFT is different than yours because mine is numbered one and yours is numbered two. They are different, meaning they have different values. They, they could have different things assigned to them. Mine could be by virtue of the fact that I bought number one, I get to go up dinner with LeBron James and you don't. Okay, you can assign different values in, in different uh, legal contracts to an NFT, to each one. So an NFT usually, um, or, or even a security token, but an NFT really uh, denotes something of value, something real of value. Whereas a cryptocurrency is, is kind of an incentive structure. It's the currency that's created to make a certain uh, blockchain run. A security token is more similar to an NFT. So a security token can be, uh, I own a particular piece of real estate or a building, 
uh, or, or I get an investment in my private company. And instead of issuing stock, I issue security tokens to represent everyone's ownership in it. So you could have a hundred security and a hundred of my, you know, ABC real estate tokens and someone else could have a hundred ABC real estate tokens. And they're all essentially the same, but it's, it's for my kind of private company. And so the value of the security token is not necessarily going to fluctuate. It's not going to be a free market value necessarily. It's not going to be, be traded on an exchange. It's going to be more informed by the value of the real estate it sits on, the income that's being generated. I can create it to where uh, as my ABC real estate generates income from rents and such, that rent gets passed on through the token. So it's a different way to, to denote ownership. And the great part about it is since it's on a blockchain, it, it, you talked earlier about ATS as the alternative trading systems that allow me to actually trade that token to someone else. So that if someone else says, I see value in that ABC real estate, I want to buy some of those tokens, I can then sell them. And that's something that liquidity is something we haven't had in private investments in things like real estate and oil and gas. We haven't had that level of liquidity. And now we might have that through security tokens. It's, mm. you know, it's one of these things is you're not investing to sell it anyway. You're investing to get the distributions you know, the energy NFTs type thing we're creating is this ability to have liquidity where there's no liquidity in it, you know? Exactly. And so that way you can, I mean, to me, um, you can participate. So, you know, I, I buy into a, uh, uh, you know, a company that, that's producing oil, for instance, of, you know, some wells that are producing oil and I, I'm, I'm enjoying my income, but let's say, ga you know, oil spikes to $115 a barrel or something. And I go, look, I'd, I just assume get out right now because someone's willing to, to pay more. Maybe someone's speculating that it's going to go to 200 or something. I'd rather get out right now and then I'll go put that money into something else to earn income. Right. Yeah. Because I, I, you know, because it, it's I didn't anticipate growth. I just anticipated income. Right. Yeah. So that that has always been lost, uh, which, you know, it's, it's nice that hopefully that will be there. Um, and then, like I said, from 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 a traditional investor standpoint, the fact that now more traditional investors are going to have access to investments like that, it makes you. And, and this is what I, I I think so few people get, and I don't and I don't mean to toot my own horn that I get it, and so few people get it, but what they don't get because they never thought about it this way is how different your life is when you start thinking of financial planning in terms of income generation and not just investment for growth. And, and the way I'll tell it to you is this is I have, you know, uh, I have, you know, a bunch of life insurance policies, right? I used to sell life insurance. So of course I have a shitload of life insurance policies because, you know, I had to buy one like every year on me and my wife and that's what got us the trip to Hawaii. Right. Um, I, you know, buy like one extra at the end of the year. I'm like, oh, if I just buy this one more, we get to go to Hawaii this year. And so I do that. Well, I took a bunch of money out of one of the policies. I told my wife, I was like, look, we can take this money, $25,000. We can buy Bitcoin miners. Okay. And those Bitcoin miners are going to produce enough every month if Bitcoin stays above $30,000 to pay for our daughter's uh, private school every month. Okay. So I'm taking $24,000 that was earning me virtually nothing. And I can decide to buy Bitcoin with it, in which case I just hope it goes up. Or I can basically invest in something that pays for my daughter's school every year. And then I don't have to worry about that anymore. I've taken an investment and paid for her school. Well, now, you know, how many other things can I do now with other investments because of that? And we're going to see so many more of so much more of that because those opportunities are now going to be there. They haven't been there for years because anything you invest in that produced income, either the income was so low that it wasn't worth it or the um, or it was so illiquid that it was scary. It was like frightening to, to get in because like I never knew um, I never knew when I would be able to get my money out. Right. Well, something like, you know, if, if I could go. Hey, you know, th these these oil tokens are, are paying pretty good royalty, paying, paying pretty good income right now. As long as oil stays above fifty dollars a barrel, I can put fifty thousand dollars into this and pay for, you know, our cars for the for, you know, several years. Well, that's another way I can think about it now. And now what's what happens is I'm earning income from all these different sources and I don't have to like I don't have to earn as much for my job. 
right? Or everything I earn from my job, like I can save more towards my retirement or more towards my daughter's college or something, right? Like it's just a totally new way to think about it because we have more income opportunities now th that are that are going to be afforded us by by blockchain tech. So that to me is really cool. I don't know. And, and, and then for, again, for the producers, for the operators, it adds the ability that now I have, I can get this investment. And once people invest in the token, they can go do it at whatever they want with it, right? I don't care that much anymore. They can go trade it if they want to. And, and by virtue of the fact that there's this ATS, like that takes care of all the legalities of it. They handle the KYC AML. I don't have to do it. You know, like they, they handle the transfer. I don't have to do it. All I know is I pay income to that token every month. And I don't care who has the token. I don't care what wallet's, wallet it's in. So, you know, coming back to your project and what you're working on there, you know, it's the, the Interaxis Academy. So just to give a bit of background, if someone wanted to join the Academy, what would they get out of it and what the whole process is then, Adam? Sure. So we, we actually have two ways you can go. If you're a financial advisor, we, we have a certification, a certified digital asset advisor certification. Uh, if you go to our website, interaxis.io, you can get over to the certification. If you're an advisor and you want to learn how to build your practice, uh, how to build cryptocurrency or build digital assets in your practice. The Interaxis Academy is something we've, we've created recently for those that want to learn about crypto, learn about uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, um, uh, custody, and, and we talk about how to invest, how we as advisors look at investing, how to make investing in cryptocurrency and digital assets uh, part of your investment portfolio instead of just a speculation, how we look at risk, how we look at allocation, uh, how to have a plan, how we look at estate planning. We talk about what some of the investment theses are with Bitcoin. We go through 20 something of the different tokens you might have access to on Coinbase or Gemini or Kraken or something. We help you set up your, your we help show you how to set up your account, set up a wallet. Why would you want to use a wallet? All those questions that you might have. And we're just going to keep adding and adding and adding more content to it. And that's the Interaxis Academy. Interaxisacademy.com is that website. You can go to it. And Alistair, we, we will also give a, uh, there's a, uh, uh, we'll give a discount code to the the listeners here, right? We will uh, we'll we'll call it uh, Boom Fifty. We're so not. We haven't cool. built a, a blockchain application. We haven't. Uh, we don't code or anything. We're just financial advisors, and we want to explain uh, how how a lot of this works. So we don't push any tokens. We don't push any particular exchanges or any products or anything. We, we don't tell you you should invest at all. We just want you to understand it, and we try to take some of these very complex concepts and complex principles and break it down in a way that people understand. And I've always thought the whiteboard is such a good way to do it. So I, it, it is as low tech as you can get. I don't even have a doodly. I, I don't, th there's nothing programmed or, or software about it. I flip on the camera and I get on the whiteboard and start explaining some concept that I think is interesting that day or, or we've researched and we think is interesting. And hopefully it helps people understand. Sometimes it's uh, investing concepts around crypto. Sometimes it is a particular protocol, a particular token. Uh, sometimes it's news, some news that came out. We want to explain what it actually means. And that's uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search Interaxis, uh, you'll find our YouTube channel. And we have, I, I think, over 100 videos there now um, that, that just explain all sorts of various concepts in, in the realm of digital assets and cryptocurrency. And that's really what our what our academy is. That's what our certification is. More than anything, it is uh, different lessons that involve me standing in front of a whiteboard explaining something to you. Perfect. Yeah, that, that, that's great there as well. I think uh, we'll leave links when we send out all the information to people so they can cover up as well. So, so yeah. appreciate your time today, Adam. Is there anything sure. else you'd like to share? I don't think there is. I, I hope people will go learn. I, I hope people stay safe. That's the most important thing for us. We, we want you to keep your money safe. We don't want you to buy things just because someone on Twitter said it or, or something like that. We want you to understand what you're doing. And that's why we, we've we created all of this. We want your advisor to understand. If you're an advisor, we want to help you. If you're an individual and you want to start investing, we want you to do it safely and, and we'll help explain it to you. Uh, and, and that's really the, the most important thing, how to look at this as an investment and not just a 
a pure speculation. Um, and if you're a, a business, a, a company that's looking to figure out how you can tokenize something or take advantage or, or be a part of blockchain or wonder where Bitcoin fits in your treasury, then you contact us as well and we can probably point you in the right direction. But that's the key. So visit, you know, our website is interaccess.io. Our, our new academy is interaccessacademy.com. And we, we just hope to see you in, in some of those lessons and some of our videos. Perfect. Well, thanks very much. It was great to see you sure. again today, Adam. So sorry, just cut on him off there. So that was really interesting with Adam uh, today. Thanks for coming on the show. And as promised, I'm going to show you one of Adam's uh, doodly videos. So this is the, the real live doodly wizard. Adam explaining uh, what is an NFT, which I think depending on the market space right now, NFTs are so hot and a lot of you might want to understand what they actually are. So over to you, Adam. Welcome to the Interaxis channel and Interaxis.io. Today we want to talk about NFTs or non-fungible tokens. They're really popular lately, especially when it comes to collectibles, when it comes to art. We're hearing a lot of NFTs. Uh, musicians are starting to release NFT uh, related music. And we want to talk a little bit about what that is because NFTs go well beyond art, and well beyond collectibles. They're a huge, huge, uh, of huge, huge interest in vastly important in the world of decentralized finance and in the, in the world of, of blockchain and just finance in general. So real quick, we got to break this down. What is an NFT? An NFT is a non-fungible token. So break that down. What does that mean? First, non-fungible versus fungible. Now, something that is fungible is exchangeable. It's the same. My dollar bill is the same as your dollar bill. They're exactly the same. My share of Tesla is the same as your share of Tesla. Okay, those are fungible. Something that is non-fungible might be something like real estate. Okay, real estate can be non-fungible. What do I mean by that? Your house is different than my house. Different address, different layout, di different everything. Okay, a, a home, like it's not just square footage under a roof. They're very different. So those are things that are non-fungible. Art is non-fungible, right? There's only one work of art. I have work on, uh, a work of art on my wall. There's probably only one of those or very few of those. Okay, that is non-fungible. And usually they're numbered, right? Works of art are numbered. So that's non-fungible because there's only one number one of some certain series of art. Those are non-fungible, and that's where we've seen this growth, is the idea of something that is that there is only one of, or there are only a few of, or that we can uh, break or break potentially into uh, smaller pieces. So where, where are non-fungible tokens being used now? We are seeing digital art being created. Now, the one thing is, you, you know, you have to like the art. That, that's one thing. If you're investing in, if you're even looking at, there's digital art that's being created. But the beauty of it is utilizing blockchain technology means that we can decide there's only a limited number of these and it's verifiable that there's a limited number. We can look on blockchain and see that this is verified there's only this limited number. If someone else tries to take some piece of art and, and, and take a screenshot of it and try to sell it somewhere, we can go verify that it's not valid. The same thing right now that you might pay an appraiser to do in the in the traditional art world, you can just do on, on chain just going, is this valid or not? Is this actual or not? Not only is there a limited number, but now I can sequentially number them. So it can be one out of a hundred of something. And maybe version one, they, they could all look exactly the same, but number one is valued differently than number 99. Okay, we, we see that happening, playing out in the digital art and collectible world. So people are creating these works of art digitally and selling them. And they could be selling them based on who, you know whoever they are. It could be based on the beholder that, that sees some value in the art and likes it. Or they could just say, look, this is a good investment because there's only one of these. There's only 50 of these and I got number one. Or I got number 25 because it's it's uh, it was going at a at a discount. You know, it's, it was selling for less than number twenty four was or something. That's where it, it's so uh, important. This idea of non fungible tokens. So we're seeing it in digital art. We're seeing it in collectibles. 
Right? We there's there's uh, you know NBA Top Shot, which is big because they're taking these moments and they're releasing them, and they're only creating a certain number of them, and they're all numbered. So there might only be five thousand of a particular moment, which is a video, and based on the importance of that, they, you know, I might get number one of that 5,000 and based on the player and the importance of the game where it was and whatever they did, it might have more or less value. And we get to trade and we get to decide what that value is based on the market, but it's verifiable how many there are and what number mine is. Whereas in the past, things like collectibles, the, the company producing them only made money if they made more and more and more of them, thus driving down the value. Now they can release collectibles and make money on the trade. They can make money on the marketplace where if I sell it to you, that company still gets two and a half percent or five percent of the of the value exchanged. And therefore, now it's in their best interest uh, to provide some level of scarcity and verifiable scarcity. That is a really important topic, verified scarcity. And I can verify it on chain. Now, I talked a little bit, that, that's a little bit about NFTs, about what we're seeing in art and collectibles. Now we're seeing it in music, where musicians can release their records, they can release their, their songs, their music, and have it all be verified on chain. This is my my record, my release. Now, once they do that, they can actually get paid as that music is being played, right? Because it's because so much of it is digital, because they can they can have this NFT version of it, and as it gets played, they can get paid a little bit. Well, based on DeFi, I might be able to participate in that. I might give that artist a thousand dollars to own a piece, and every time that song is played, my little token, my little piece of ownership, because I have an NFT. We'll go back to this. So let's say this. I might have okay, artists release a, a, a record. I might pay a thousand dollars, or you know what? We'll call it a uh, thousand USDC because we want to keep consistent here thousand USDC to own an NFT that represents, you know, 1% of that particular record. And every time that record is played and one USDC gets paid to this particular record, I get 1% of that. Okay. That comes to me. Well, that's really valuable. That's a way that artists can start funding themselves. They can just say, look, you know, musicians can go, I'm going to create these songs. And if anyone believes in me and likes them, you can buy a little bit, give me a little bit of money up front. And every time the song is played, you get a, a little bit of it. Now we're taking some of the financing out of the, the realm of the music producers and out of the realm of the of, of the big uh, record labels and out of the realm of the banks and saying, we're going to give more people access to help out musicians or help out artists. The other way that NFTs work, remember, I mentioned early on that an NFT could be real estate. OK, an NFT could be part of a private my ownership in a private company. That is where we see trillions of dollars flowing into decentralized finance. So an NFT can be you know, a, a real estate deal. So I might own a piece of this real estate deal. And, we, and we've talked about security tokens, but this is essentially what it is. A security token is a non-fungible token that might represent my ownership in a real estate offering, a real estate investment, or it might, in, in, it might be my ownership in uh, a private equity deal or a hedge fund deal or a bond or something. And now is, is um, denominated or denoted by this token that is on chain, which means it can all be verified. So if I take this NFT and try to get a loan from, uh, again, we will stick with decentralization and there's some DeFi based lender, they can verify this NFT on chain that I actually have ownership in this particular real estate deal and maybe they lend me money. Okay, and this can all be verified like that. That's going to be the beauty of NFTs. Now, this NFT can be real estate. It could be my ownership in this particular song. It could be this work of art, right? And because it's NFT, because it's token based, if I want to pledge my art, my, my digital art as collateral, or even ownership in real art as collateral, I can do so because this lender, this DeFi lender says, you're going to pledge that as collateral. And if you don't pay, we'll just own it now. It's all on chain anyway. 
Okay, so that's the beauty here. I can use potentially my collateral, my collectibles as collateral now. They have value. Everyone can see that this is real. There's nothing counterfeit here. Things I would have to pay an appraiser for in the past, I don't have to do that anymore. It's all done on chain. So this is the beauty of, of NFTs. Now, NFTs can even include other things. So again, this NFT for, the, for real estate means that I own a piece of it. I own a piece of some deal, but maybe my NFT also gets me the ability to stay at this hotel chain five days out of the year or something like that. Maybe it gets me that. Maybe you know it gets me a piece of the income. Maybe the fact that I bought an NFT for some record means that, yes, I, I will get paid for it, but maybe it also means that I get a private party with that artist at some point. When, when their record gets a million plays, I get a private party because I was one of the investors. I can prove it because I have this NFT sitting in my wallet. That's my ticket into the party. Okay, if I buy a collectible from some basketball player, maybe I get tickets to a game. Maybe I get in a raffle and I can prove it all. So NFTs are going to be wildly important. We see it really hot right now in the terms of digital art and even in terms of music and collectibles, but it's going to be so much bigger than that because the fact that these are all verified, scarce, on-chain, all these aspects means that now they can be part of the decentralized finance ecosystem. So that is a little bit, just a small bit about NFTs and you can...